Hello everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com and supported by Vizjolia. So in continuation with the pneumonia series, I'm sure looking at these illustrations, you would have known that I'll be talking about a very important type of pneumonia that is community acquired pneumonia. We will see the epidemiology, the etiopathogenesis and the morphology of uh, community acquired pneumonia, particularly we will discuss the differences between lobar and bronco pneumonia. When I say community acquired pneumonia, I'm talking about community acquired acute pneumonias. I'm not talking about the chronic pneumonias now. We will discuss that later. So, what is this community acquired pneumonia? This is a lung infection in an otherwise healthy individual that is acquired from the normal environment. They are classified or categorized into community acquired bacterial pneumonia and community acquired viral pneumonias. So, we will discuss about community acquired bacterial pneumonia today. Though we have categorized community acquired pneumonia into community acquired bacterial and viral, it's really difficult to differentiate between these two because, you know, I mean, the radiologic as well as clinical features overlap. But then there is a marker called procalcitonin which is an acute phase reactant that will be significantly elevated in community acquired you know, bacterial pneumonias than as compared to that of viral infections. So, we should know what are all the predisposing conditions which results in community acquired pneumonias. One, extremes of age. Patients who are in, you know, who are with chronic diseases like congestive heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, as well as diabetes. Patients who are having, or individuals who are having congenital or acquired immune deficiencies. We talked about this, right, in the earlier session that we, how and why immune deficiencies leads to pulmonary infections. Lastly, decreased or absent splenic function and this is very important because there is a risk for infection with encapsulated bacteria such as pneumococcus whenever there is splenic function insufficiency. The reason for this is we should note that the spleen is the major site of production of these anti-polysaccharide antibodies, you know, and these are the dominant protective antibodies against the, you know, capsular or the encapsulated bacteria. So, whenever there is a defect in the splenic function that leads to increased risk of development of these encapsulated bacterial infections. So, now let's look into what are all the various organisms which can cause community acquired bacterial pneumonia. The first and the most common one is Streptococcus pneumoniae or pneumococcus. Second is Haemophilus influenzae, Moraxella cateralis, Staphylococcus aureus, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Legionella and rarely Mycoplasma pneumoniae. The first one is Streptococcus pneumoniae which is a gram-positive lancet-shaped diplococci. This is the most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia. Even though the incidence of pneumococcal pneumonia is decreasing because of pneumococcal vaccination, this is still the most common cause of community acquired bacterial pneumonia. See, the diagnosis of this kind of pneumonia rests on demonstration of diplococci in neutrophils in the sputum. But then, since the streptococcus pneumonia is also part of normal endogenous flora in around 20% of adults, this can be false positive. The second one is Haemophilus influenzae, which is a pleomorphic gram-negative bacilli. It can be encapsulated or non-encapsulated. The encapsulated ones has six serotypes of which the type B is the most virulent. If you have antibodies against the capsule, that will protect the host and that's why almost all the vaccines of the against Haemophilus influenzae contain capsular polysaccharide B antigen. Usually, Haemophilus influenza pneumonia follows a viral respiratory infection and it is very important to note that this is a pediatric emergency with a very high mortality. It also causes acute purulent conjunctivitis, it's pink eye in children. And this is the most common bacterial cause of acute exacerbations of chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases in adults. The third one is Moraxella cateralis. This is the cause of bacterial pneumonia, especially in the elderly, particularly those with cardiopulmonary diseases or even diabetes mellitus or immunodeficiencies. And after Haemophilus influenzae, this is the second most common bacterial cause of acute exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Staphylococcus aureus. Again, it usually follows the viral respiratory illnesses like for example measles in children and influenza in both children and adults. People who are intravenous drug abusers, they are at very high risk. 
it is usually associated with a very high incidence of complications such as lung abscess and empyema, which we will be discussing later. Klebsiella pneumonia is another organism which is the most frequent cause of gram-negative bacterial pneumonia. It commonly affects the debilitated and particularly you know, chronic alcoholics. The very characteristic feature of Klebsiella pneumonia is that it produces thick mucoid, often blood in sputum, that's uh, difficult to expectorate because of its thickness. So remember, if you have a very thick mucoid uh, no, or uh, blood in sputum, think about Klebsiella pneumonia. And last one is Legionella pneumophilia, which causes Legionnaire's disease. And that's the epidemic and the sporadic forms of pneumonia. And it also causes Pontiac fever. Pontiac fever is a self-limited upper respiratory tract infection. This organism flourishes in artificial uh, and aquatic environments, particularly the water cooling towers, the tubing systems of the domestic portable supplies like shower heads, sink faucets, even hot tubs. That's why these uh, kind of pneumonia are common in places which you have these artificial aquatic environments. How is it? How is this transmitted? Just like any other pneumonia, this is also transmitted either by inhalation or even aspiration of contaminated drinking water and predisposing conditions for this is usually cardiac, renal, immunologic or hematologic diseases and often organ transplant recipients also are at risk for development of Legionella pneumophilia pneumonia. Again, uh, to diagnose this kind of pneumonia, you need to uh, demonstrate the Legionella antigens in the urine or the DNA in the sputum by PCR-based methods. Of course, culture is a gold standard to diagnose any kind of pneumonia, but it takes three to five days. So, when it comes to the morphological features of any of these kind of pneumonia, we describe uh, uh, in two different patterns. One is lobular or bronchopneumonia, second is lobar pneumonia. Uh, at this point, you need to understand the word consolidation. What is consolidation? Consolidation means it's a solidification of the lung. Normally, lung is aerated, right? right? So, when it is solidified, that's because of the replacement of the air by the exudate in the alveoli, then it is referred to as consolidation. So, lobular or bronchopneumonia, the consolidation is patchy. It can involve the entire lung or it can usually it is in the base of basal lobes whereas lobar pneumonia here the consolidation is uh, a large portion of a lobe or the entire lobe so you can see that this is a patchy consolidation what you are observing here and this is replacement or solidification of the entire lobe itself so patchy consolidation on the cut section of the lung parachyma this is an illustration showing consolidation affecting the entire lobe but then remember it is not a hard and fast rule that any pneumonia what we have studied so far has either of these patterns because the patterns can overlap okay initially it can begin as lobular then pro pro progress and then form or affect the entire lobe causing lobar pneumonia and uh, also it is important to note that the same organisms can produce any of these patterns and that depends upon the susceptibility of the patients. Usually, extremes of age individuals are more prone for development of bronchopneumonia. So, that's a gross you know, specimen of lobar pneumonia. You can see that the lower lobe is uniformly consolidated as compared to that of the upper lobe, which looks aerated. Of course, you have lots of anthracotic pigment seen here. The second important term you need to understand here is hepat. Hepat means liver, right? You know, hepatization is what we refer. That is because the Consistency of the lung, which is normally spongy, uh, it because of consolidation, it becomes firm, like liver-like. That's why it's called hepatization. So, morphologically, uh, in a classic case of lobar pneumonia, morphologically, it goes through four different stages. One is stage of congestion, where the lungs are enlarged. It's engorged because of vascular en engorgement. Usually, the lungs are heavy and red. In the stage of red hepatization, as the name says, the lung is red, firm hepatization because it is solidified. Now, it is firm, airless and liver-like consistency as I told you. The third one is a grey hepatization where the lungs are grey-brown, firm and lungs grey-brown because the uh, RBCs are being you know, degraded and then the uh, colour changes from red 
to grayish and lastly resolution stage where the infected exudate is usually coughed out or ingested by macrophages or it can sometimes be organized in form of fibrosis so microscopically the stages of lobar pneumonia again follows the same four stages the first one is a stage of congestion where upon exposure of these bacilli you know the interstitium uh, and the alveoli you can see these congested blood vessels and the interstitium is filled with fluid proteinaceous fluid because you know increased vascular permeability is the first muscular event in inflammation right whenever the alveoli is exposed to these bacteria there is an inflammatory response you need to remember concepts of inflammation the vascular events and cellular events so everything you can understand in the stages of pneumonia first one is a vascular event right so you have congested blood vessels there is increased vascular permeability that is the reason why you find the alveolar spaces filled with proteinaceous material second one is a red hepatization where the alveoli predominantly is filled with rbcs along with neutrophils you know that the first line of defense is the neutrophils which comes towards a site of inflammation right so lots and lots of neutrophils are seen in the alveolar spaces along with red blood cells and along with congested blood vessels and in the in, in the inter alveolar space or the interstitium and this is a stage of red hepatization gray hepatization see in this case the rbc starts to disintegrate the congestion starts to come down and then the more and more macrophages starts to appear you know that after three to five days the macrophages starts coming in right so you have macrophages you have neutrophils and then the lot of fibrin being deposited here you see the clear space between the you know organized exudate uh, and the alveolar walls right so this is a classical stage of gray hepatization and finally the alveolar spaces are near normal in the resolution space resolution stage because all the macrophages uh, have ingested all these organisms and the neutrophils are dead and the sputum is expelled out in the form of expectoration so till now what we understood is the uh, microscopy and macroscopic features of classical case of lobar pneumonia of course you don't see such classical cases nowadays because patients are treated very early in the course of disease so you don't actually go through all these stages so what do you see in bronchopneumonia macroscopically it's often multi lobar uh, and frequently bilateral and often basal in location and the lesions are slightly elevated dry and granular it can be gray red to yellow usually they are poorly delineated at their margins and microscopically the consolidated areas what you see on microscopy is areas of suppurative inflammation which can fill the bronchi which can fill the bronchioles and even the adjacent alveolar spaces so in between these foci of bronchopneumonia the uh, intervening lung parenchyma will be absolutely normal and aerated so once we understood the concepts of the pathogenesis of uh, lobar and bronchopneumonia along with the morphological features it's easy for us to correlate them into clinical features these patients presents with abrupt onset of high grade fever shaking chills and cough you know why fever lots and lots of neutrophils and macrophages are there in the alveoli which releases lots of interleukin particularly interleukin 1 which results in fever and chills and cough because of the presence of uh, secretions it has to expel out right so fever and cough usually mucopurulent sputum purulent meaning presence of pus in the sputum and occasionally it can be hemoptysis also if there is involvement of the pleura in the form of pleuritis there will be pleurite pain and the pleural friction rub how do you diagnose uh, community acquired bacterial pneumonias Uh, x-rays uh, can somewhat tell you whether you are looking at the lobar involvement or the lobular involvement in the lobar it is whole lobe is radio opaque whereas uh, bronchopneumonia you find a uh, focal opacity of course it's very difficult as i told you earlier to differentiate between this between whether it is really bacterial or viral but then the culture is a gold standard you have to identify the organism and determine the antibiotic sensitivity for it to be effectively treated so how do you treat them by antibiotics of course the patients uh, may become if a febrile with very few clinical symptoms within 48 to 72 hours if they are responding to that particular with the organisms are responding to that particular antibiotic less than 10% very few uh, may require hospitalization usually the death in these cases uh, may be due to 
complications and of course the complications you see only in patients who are having some predisposing conditions which we discussed earlier now let us see what are all the complications you can expect okay if the pneumonia is not treated properly or if it is not identified and the first one is the abscess formation and that's because of the tissue destruction and necrosis and they are, these kind of abscess formation is common with the pneumococcal and the Klebsiella infections. We talked about it earlier, right? So, abscess formation is common in Streptococcus pneumonia and Klebsiella pneumonia. Second one being empyma. Empyma means, you know, pus in the pleural cavity. That's because of spread of infection into the pleural cavity where there is intrapleural fibrinosuppurative reaction. There are lots and lots of pus you can see in the pleural cavity and that is called empyma. And thirdly, bacteremic dissemination. You have bacteria in the entire lung parenchyma, right? In the entire alveolar spaces and in the blood vessels. So, the bacteria can be disseminated into the various organs in the body like the heart valves, the pericardium, the brain, kidney, spleen or any other organ causing um, uh, inflammation in those organs. For example, it can cause abscesses in the kidney, it can cause involvement of heart in the form of myocarditis, brain in the form of meningitis. If it is involved in the joints, it can result in suppurative arthritis. So, this is all about community acquired bacterial pneumonia. We did discuss all the aspects of community acquired bacterial pneumonia. So, I would suggest you to click on the practice session in the link below and this is via Visdolia where you can answer all the multiple choice questions, clinical scenarios and these kind of practice sessions will make your learning much much simpler and meaningful. It is fun to learn by this way. So, that's about community acquired bacterial pneumonia. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, hit the like button, do comment, do consider subscribing if you find this video useful and please do share and don't forget to attempt these practice session thank you